telephone system presents Telephone Time. Telephone Time with Dr. Frank Baxter. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? It once happened that America's most famous mystery novelist, seeking a plot for her next book, found a perfect subject in real life, a case that had all the elements of a thriller. Piracy on the high seas, an unknown murderer stalking the decks of a panic-stricken ship, and a murder trial that was a national sensation. We're going to tell you the story of how Mary Roberts Reinhardt used the actual events of the terrifying voyage of the Herbert Fuller in writing her famous novel, The After House. We've got a visitor, Weber. Come all the way from Pittsburgh. Mrs. Reinhardt has deposited some money with me so you won't run out of tobacco. I'm a writer, Mr. Weber. I'd like to ask you a few questions about the Herbert Fuller. Go away. Oh, come on now. That's no way to behave. I still got one right to be left alone. You'll be left alone, all right, in solitary guard. Please, please don't. Please, please. Let him bring his guard. I'll break you, Weber. You'll rot down there this time. Oh, no, Warden, don't. It's all my fault. I shouldn't have come. What's the matter, fine lady? You want to know how it feels to be with a man who killed two men and a woman with an axe, don't you? No. I want to know how it feels to be that man. What's the trouble, sir? Perhaps he'd talk to me if you left us alone. Oh, I'm afraid that's not possible now. Let her in. If she wants to that bad. I do, please. All right, go ahead. Thank you. I'll be just down the corridor. Thank you. You're wasting your time and money. Newspapers stopped being interested in writing about me 15 years ago. But I'm not from the newspapers. I write novels, mystery stories. No mystery here. Everybody knows I'm guilty. Two juries said so. But I'm not a jury or a judge, Mr. Weber. Only a writer who's never even been to sea. Well, what do you want to ask me? I'd like to find out as much as I can about you. As much as you're willing to tell me. About your life, your family. I've got no family. Time I was nine, I'd gone to sea. Cabin boy and cook's flunky. At every man's beck and call, 20 hours a day. My pay... Suit with brass buttons and all the slops I could eat. The sea is hard, ma'am. And the men who want a sailor have to be hard, too. Ernst Weber was the hardest of the lot. The last pirate of the 19th century. Was the way the newspapers put it. I know all that, Mr. Weber. Then why'd you come? Is it a thrill you're after? I want to write a story about the Herbert Fuller, but I can't make fiction out of fact unless I know all of the fact. Would you be willing to tell me everything you remember about that night? And do you think that'll give you all of your fact, as you call it? You're under no compulsion to tell it. The money the warden spoke about has already been deposited. I won't take it back. There's nothing to tell. What there is, you're welcome to, seeing as you already paid for it. July 13, 1896. The tenth day out of Boston, bound with lumber for the Argentine, running south southwest under full canvas, light rain falling. I had the watch. As Mary Roberts Reinhardt pored over the dry stenographic notes, the record of the trial she had borrowed from the Attorney General, she could almost hear the voices of the prosecutor, the witnesses, the judge. But one voice echoed in her memory. One face haunted her, Ernest Weber, 
and the harsh, protesting words beat on her like a storm. Ernest Weber, Ernest Weber. Did I frighten you? No, I was surprised. I, I was thinking. You're working much too hard. You know how late it is. What is it, Mary? Oh, Stan, there's something terribly wrong, and I don't know what to do. Weber is innocent. Do you realize what you're saying? Of course I do. But how can you be so sure? Well, you haven't seen him. He, he's like stone, like granite. He might have killed the two men, but the woman never. That's only a feeling, Mary. No, there's the transcripts, too. And what did you find here that makes you so sure? Oh, many things. All of it, in fact. But what specifically? Well, Stan, it's more than any single specific thing. It's a feeling I have about the whole of it. What I know now makes the evidence he was convicted on a mockery. What are you shaking your head at? Don't you believe me? A feeling. A woman's intuition again. If you want to call it that, yes. Mary, here are the records of two trials conducted on rigid legal line. Two judges, two juries. All of them decided he was guilty. And they did it on facts, not feelings then all of them were wrong. And your woman's intuition is right. Yes. The newspapers reported you're saying you'd been drugged. I read that. But if you were well enough to walk a wet, unlighted deck, surely you were well enough to hear. The ship's bed, yes. And the other sounds of her that I'd heard a thousand times walking that deck. Walking it, even if in my sleep. Is that what you claim now? That you were asleep? No. The fact, as you call it, is that I was drunk. Well, then you lied at your trial. Why didn't you tell the truth? Do you think the truth would have saved me? Admitting to those blue-nosed snobs on that jury that I was drunk on watch? Ah, uh, that really would have fixed me for the news. How do you do, Mr. Martin? How do you do, Mrs. Reinhardt? Please sit down, will you? Thank you. I, I'm sorry I had to bring you here, Mrs. Reinhardt, but you've abused a confidence. Ordinarily, only members of the bar are permitted access to transcripts. As Attorney General, I made an exception in your case because you told me you were seeking a plot for a book. But that's all I intended in the beginning. Then why did you hide the fact that you visited Atlanta Penitentiary to see Weber? I didn't hide it. My dear, naive Mrs. Reinhardt, don't you know by now that all convicted criminals are innocent, they say? Weber never said it. What exactly did you promise him? Mr. Martin, I assure you, Ernest Weber knows nothing of what I've done. I feel safe in assuming that he believes I think him guilty, the same as everyone else. Then why are you doing all this? Because I feel it's my duty. To Weber? Yes, but also to myself and to you, sir. To all of us who are responsible for his fate. The case was closed 15 years ago, Mrs. Reinhardt. Is that any excuse for... Leaving it closed and adding to the horror. But you have no proof of his innocence. I told you. That he admitted to you that he was drunk on watch. That he said that he threw the axe overboard because he was afraid the mutiny was directed at him. These are not facts. And they are certainly not sufficient legal evidence for reopening the case. I'm very sorry. 
And if I could name the real murderer and prove it to you? As you would in one of your mysteries. Yes, why not? I'm afraid it would have little effect, Mrs. Reinhardt. You see, we here do not live in the world of imagination where things go as we wish. We can proceed only on legal evidence, not on women's intuition. Come in. Begging your pardon for the interruption, ma'am, but this gentleman says he has an appointment. Blake's the name. Yes, of course, Mr. Blake. Thank you, Margaret. Won't you sit down, Mr. Blake? Won't be necessary. Now, I suppose you uh, describe what's missing and who in the house you suspect. But nothing's been stolen, Mr. Blake. I want you for an entirely different kind of investigation. We don't handle divorce cases. But you do handle murder. This is what I'd like you to do. I want you to locate these four men. Now, I call them the student, the man at the wheel, the steward, and the lookout. Their real names are on the attached notes. Mm, and when they've been located, then what? I want you to find out everything you can about each of them. What jobs they hold, the state of their health, mental as well as physical, whether they're married, you know, everything. Why do you want to know all this? Because 15 years ago, one of them killed three people with an axe. And you want me to tell you which one? No, 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 no. I want you to tell me everything else. I'll tell you which one. I'm not in the crusading business, Mary. I'm only your publisher. But that's why I've come to you. It's the only avenue left. I want this book to arouse a storm of indignation the way Zola did with the Dreyfus case. But you said yourself you have no real proof. But I will have as soon as Blake finishes his investigation. Investigations, private detectives, you're a woman, Mary. What will people say? Have you thought of the sensationalism, of the legal complications, of the probability of libel suits? The only thing that concerns me is that a man has spent 15 years in prison for a crime he never committed. And I thought all you were planning was another thriller. Look at these royalty statements, and you'll see how well the circular staircase and the man in lower ten are doing. Now, wouldn't it be better if you stuck to what you know? But this is a real case. A man's life is at stake. Yes, I know. That's why I have to tell you I think it's a job for a lawyer, not a woman who writes mystery thrillers. You'd be contending that the police, the courts, those who deal with real crime are wrong, and that you're right. People will laugh, Mary. Let them. Will that win justice for the man in prison? Now, think, Mary. Think how hard you've worked to win your reputation. This could destroy it. I'm willing to take that chance. I'm sorry, Mary. It wouldn't be fair to you or the company to let you. Is your telephone. And here is Hawaii. Today, your telephone can take you to Hawaii in minutes, faster than ever before. You can now make telephone calls to the Hawaiian Islands as clearly as calling someone in your own hometown. New underseas cables stretching 2,400 miles along the floor of the Pacific Ocean bring people in the islands as close to you as those on the mainland. These new cables provide three times as many telephone circuits as were provided by radio telephone alone. For business calls, the new Pacific cables now put you in touch with the person you're calling more quickly than ever before, making it easy to keep in touch with the growing Hawaiian market. For family calls, too, when friends or members of your family are in Hawaii, the cost of calling them is low, and even lower at night and on Sundays. Though separated by thousands of miles, you can keep in touch with them by merely picking up your telephone. And to make service faster, 
your long-distance operator dials directly to the telephone you're calling in Honolulu. Yes, today, voice highways beneath the broad Pacific to Hawaii. The newest link between you and a world of telephones. Telephone people working together to make your service better and more efficient than ever before making it easier for you, wherever you are, to talk to your family, friends, or business associates, wherever they are, the world over. Why I should have admitted to you that I was drunk, I still do not myself understand. Perhaps it was because you were able to look upon me as a man and not as a brute animal. Therefore, I wish to tell you something now that I have not said to any other human being in almost 15 years. Before Almighty God, I swear that I never committed the crime for which I unjustly suffer behind prison bars. Signed, Ernest Weber. How can I answer this? What can I tell him? That you tried. Mm -hmm. And that I failed and that I've given up. Have you given up? What else can I do? Did it ever occur to you that your publisher might have been right? Now, wait a minute. Listen to me. He refuses to publish the kind of a book you want. But he'd publish a thriller. So why not write one? I thought at least you understood. I do. You're the one that doesn't yet. Now listen to me. You could use all the evidence you have, all you've deduced, but not written as a tract. Instead, do what you know best. Write a perfectly plotted mystery based on your evidence and with only one possible solution, the unmasking of the real murderer. Stan, do you think it would work? Do you think I could? I know you could. Good ship, Herbert Fuller. There wasn't much good about her, except she was Boston built. Well, now I shan't be confused anymore between the foremast, mainmast, and the mizzen. And that's the crow's nest, isn't it? Where the lookout watched from. Aye. He lashed himself in in foul weather. She's perfect to the last detail. If you look sharp, you can see her name on the bell. Yes. And uh, here's her drawings. Thank you, Mr. Harris. I've labeled it, maybe you ask. Your clock struck before the hour. Did it? Well, you're right. <laughs> Thank you very much. No thanks called for. You paid a good price. <laughs> Not many of us want sailing models anymore. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Harris. Goodbye. Practicing medicine last seven years, married two children. Well, that about finishes the university student. Ray Stewart, Horatio Spencer. 
Subject work for last 11 years, family on Beacon Street, Boston, last nine years, holding position of butler deacon the Second Baptist Church. You want more? Man at wheel. I uh, had a little trouble finding him. It's signed on the Herbert Fuller as Charlie Brown. The real name is Kurt Wolfgang Mueller, located in the Park Central Hospital, Baltimore. What's wrong with him? Cancer. Subject calm, resigned to end. Interview to Reverend Matthews, the old sailor's mission where subject resided last five years, assisting at service and playing organ. The Reverend and the other neighbors attested that subject was of highest moral character. Go on. The lookout, Walter Olson, deceased August 3rd, 1911. Survived by widow Agnes of 386 Watkins Avenue, Cleveland, Ohio. Widow stated reluctantly that spouse was haunted to grave by guilt and remorse. Due to events aboard the Herbert Fuller. That's right. I already know why. You do? He was probably asleep on lookout. That's what he claimed, all right. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Blake. If you'll send your bill, I'll have a check forwarded immediately. Well, I'm sorry if you're not satisfied what the investigation showed. Well, it's not your fault. I think I was expecting a miracle. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. Good day, Mr. Blake. Don't be too disappointed, darling. Oh. I'd better get the manuscript sent off. I've waited too long already. It's a fine book, Mary. Your best. But will it help? <laughs> Then you admit your book is fiction. Of course. But the characters are patterned after real people, are they not? All you've changed are the names. Of the members of the crew, yes. And you insist it constitutes proof of Weber's innocence? For those it succeeded in convincing. Would you consider former President Theodore Roosevelt one of those convinced? Mr. Roosevelt was kind enough to read my book and comment favorably on it. Isn't he taking an interest in the case? Yes, he has spoken of the possibility of his writing letters to certain people. In the face of the Attorney General's statement that a mystery thriller holds no legal effect? Are you aware of the fact that the Attorney General said if he were the man accused in this book, he'd sue? Gentlemen, gentlemen, please. Mrs. Reinhardt's been over all that once already. I'm sorry, but that will have to be all for now. No, no you're not to go in there. Who are you? What's the meaning of this? I'm a newspaper man. Well, you're late. The interview is over. But I've come all the way from Baltimore. My editor... I don't care if you came from the moon. Out. All the way from Baltimore, huh? How come, Junior? What's your editor want? An exclusive? You bet I... Never mind. Now it's Baltimore. This thing's getting out of hand, Mary. And all those crank letters you can get. Swine, I've, I've just got to ask you some questions before the other papers here. This is outrageous. Is it true or isn't it that the man at the wheel in your book is really Carl Mueller? If you don't get away from here this instant, I'm calling the police. Because if it is, I think you should know that Mueller tried to kill someone else. What? Yes, ma'am. Late last night in a Park Central Hospital in Baltimore. Mueller went after his nurse with a knife. I got my editor to send me up here right away. Oh, come in. No, no, go around at the door. Stan, it's a miracle. What are you going to do? I'm going to Baltimore myself, immediately. I'm afraid it's useless, Mrs. Reinhardt. You could talk to him all day and it wouldn't do any good. What is he doing? It's all right, he can't hear us. You mean he can't hear us at all? Mueller? Carl Mueller? Mueller, can you hear me? Nothing. See, it'll take a very special kind of stimulus to bring him out of it. Stimulus? Doctor, may I try something? <laughs> Why not? I'd need a bell. A bell? Oh, uh... Padloff's dog. I'm afraid that wouldn't work. You see, conditioned reflex is a very different thing. Let me try, anyway. It won't take long, and then I'd go. Very well. I'll see what I can find.
Brown. Charlie Brown. Do you hear me? Charlie Brown. Brown. Remember the Herbert Fuller? I... The ungodly wickedness. That woman and her man. And the other... But six bells have sounded, Charlie Brown. Didn't you hear? I... It's time. The axe. I must get my axe and wipe out the wickedness. Wipe out the wickedness. I must get my axe. Death to the wicked. Death to the wicked. Wipe out the wickedness. Wipe out the wickedness. Wipe it out. Wipe it out. Wipe it out. On August 27th, 1913, the man twice convicted by juries, twice sentenced by judges for the murders aboard the Herbert Fuller, found justice. And after this announcement, I'd like to tell you about it. On television again, the spectacular science series program, Our Mr. Sun, presented by the Bell Telephone System. See the inspiring story of the sun, produced and directed by Frank Capra, Starring Eddie Albert and Dr. Frank Baxter. On Sunday afternoon, December 15th, Our Mr. Sun. Check your paper for time and station. Ernest Weber was paroled in 1913. Six years later, the case was finally closed. In 1919, in the middle of the struggle over the League of Nations, Woodrow Wilson took time out to sign a presidential pardon for Weber. Like Harriet Beecher Stowe, Charles Dickens, Emil Zola, a novelist with conviction, Mary Roberts Reinhardt, had used a novel to correct a social injustice. Now let me tell you about our story for next week. The Alamo Falls and the young Republic of Texas is threatened by defeat and tragedy. Sam Houston takes command of the little army, a rabble of an army, hungry to attack. But Sam begins 40 long days of retreat, holding his angry, mutinous forces together until he strikes for victory at San Jacinto. Until it's time for that story, ladies and gentlemen, goodbye. Join us for Telephone Time next week. Until then, we remain sincerely yours, the Bell Telephone System.